lost it for a while. Okay, everybody, here we are in uh, Ephesians, right? <clears throat> this is the fourth chapter, and uh, we still have some ground to cover. This is the uh, 20th verse. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that you have heard of him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness <clears throat> and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Well, Lord, uh, lead and guide us here this morning. We, we thank you for uh, being able to uh, provide this opportunity for us to meet in such a fashion. We look for your blessings, Lord, as we open the word. We pray that we would become obedient to every line and uh, bring a blessing to all of us in our various needs. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I think, uh, well, we covered quite a bit of area last week, but I think we still have some details on the 22nd verse, so 27th verse. So let's take a look here. And it says, neither give place to the devil. Well, you know, the devil doesn't need much of an invitation, if you haven't noticed. Uh, you know, he, he can knock at the door. We don't have to open the door and invite him in and have a seat, you know. So we're instructed in the scripture uh, to not give him place, not give him a place, a foothold in other words. So there are various passages that lead us to this and uh, certainly Ephesians 6 speaks of us putting on the whole armor of God and standing against the wiles of the devil. So uh, we're guarding the door, you see, he's not getting in, you know, that sort of thing. When James 4 says to submit yourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. <clears throat> so, you know, the uh, the idea of passivity, that somehow we're just supposed to lay back and let uh, God do all the work. No, no, no. We have to be vigilant, sober. We have to be defending our ground, and we must not let Satan take any ground back from, from us. So uh, you can see here that there is a battle being waged, and believers have to be alert and uh and serve the lord with alacrity so we resist the devil so uh, we we can't uh, prevent him it's it's part of the experience here on earth the trials and tribulations god permits uh this will strengthen us if we uh, win win the battle if we stand in the might of the lord of course it's all because of god's power that we stand we don't stand in our own strength uh, we, we're weaklings but uh, we have the great uh, captain of the Lord's hosts on our side. And as Joshua said, if you're for us, then victory is ours tomorrow. There's another verse in Romans I like, and this is, uh, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can see that again in Ephesians where it says, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And here again, you put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We put on the armor, we put on the robe of righteousness, you know, put on Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Uh, again, this is giving place, giving a place, a foothold. Uh, we must not make provision for the flesh. Well, the flesh is always crying out for something. Uh, so uh, it's like a spoiled brat demanding, making demands of us all the time. So the Christian life is a life of discipline after all. And uh, that's what discipleship means, discipline. And it means disciplining the heart and the mind and uh, training ourselves to be vigilant. And uh, we're at war. So we 
must walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Perhaps we'll go right into the fifth chapter of Ephesians here and we'll see some of those exhortations as well. Oh yes, well the devil, uh, he doesn't give up easily, that's for certain. Uh, you may defeat him now, but he'll be back tomorrow. We think of uh, Jesus' 40 days of temptation in the wilderness. Uh, Satan at the end throws the last three great temptations, but cannot defeat Christ. And so the scripture says that uh, Satan left him for a season. Uh, so that's interesting. He left him for a season. He didn't leave him all altogether. He just, he was defeated and he went went away for a while, but he, he'll he come back and uh, it'll be the same case for us. Let's, uh, let's recall. <clears throat> And so the Bible teaches about the devil and his various personas and uh, some of the metaphors that are uh, given to us so that we can uh, be aware. And in John chapter 10, we find him as a thief, don't we? And uh, what do we do about thieves? Well, I wonder how many of you here probably, you probably have a by now a ring camera, right? You have that at your front door, maybe your back door. You've got security lights. You've got, uh, you want to make sure that if there's any prowlers or thieves that uh, you're all aware of it and light is lighting you know that uh, they love to uh, they love to work in the dark don't they thieves uh, we find them in uh, in the with the masquerade on you know they have a mask and they have a hood on usually you know so that they can't be seen and that's how the devil works he's, he works furtively and surreptitiously <clears throat> so we have to be uh, be aware of this he's a thief and he's coming to steal. He wants to steal your peace. He wants to steal your faith. He wants to steal your uh, power. So we have to all uh, be vigilant and sober and uh, disciplined and, and ready to fight him, meet the onslaught of the, of the evil of the day. Also, this scripture tells us he's a, he's a murderer, right? Hear of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. So... Uh, that's also rather descriptive of who he is and what he is about at the end. Um, why, if he had his way, he would have killed us long ago. So uh, we have protective angels uh, that uh, that keep us from falling. We don't know the half of this, by the way. I suppose it won't be until eternity that we see how many times we've been protected. But the devil uh, would love to eliminate us. So we'll keep all of that in mind as well. And... Uh, you know, we want to. We can't give him any place. If you give him place, he'll uh, he'll destroy your life. Peter also uh, gives us a metaphor, descriptive of Satan and how he works, uh, and that is as a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Uh, so again, how would you, uh, if you knew there was a lion in the neighborhood, I think you'd, you'd be walking very carefully, right? You'd be watching all the time and on the lookout and, uh, and expecting at any moment, you know, he could be in the bushes somewhere and then just kind of lunge forward and attack. And this is, uh, this is the way that uh, a cat works. So we have, uh, we have those three descriptive uh, verses right there that help us to not give place to the devil. So our passage really is about sanctification, isn't it? And uh, we find in the Bible how many places where the, the scripture tells us that we're to separate uh, from the world and, and in a sense be a, a peculiar people. The ways of the Christian are peculiar to the world. Uh, now we we find this as a badge of honor, by the way. Uh, if they if someone should find you peculiar, this is a, this is a good thing. This scripture, uh, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and I shall be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Uh, so Paul has this in mind, this is in 2 Corinthians. So the idea of separation, uh, this is not some unusual teaching by the way. Today, uh, there's so much emphasis today on grace and I'm certainly a grace preacher, I believe in grace, but uh, you know, uh, grace does not give us a license to sin. Uh, the Bible still uh, maintains that believers are called out, separated. They are to be a sanctified people, a peculiar people. Uh, this, of course, uh, uh, it it, uh, it runs contrary with uh, 
the nature of the flesh. The flesh wants to have liberty, do whatever it wants to do, and so on. But uh, we've become followers of Christ. And again, this makes us a peculiar people. There it is at First Peter. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of God. Uh, Titus tells us uh, who gave himself, Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Then again in Deuteronomy, we look in the Old Testament concept for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God and the, the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. So, uh, so this admonition we find here in the 27th verse is to not give place to the devil. We're not going to give him any ground uh, because you do that, of course, what's the old expression? You give him an inch, he'll take a mile. So we have to, we have to stand fast, hold our ground, and, uh, and not let the devil take us back or pull us back into his vortex of evil. Well, the next admonition that we have in the 28th verse, let him that stole steal no more. Now, um, I don't, I'm overlooking here a group. I doubt that we have any thieves in the group here, but, uh, you know, this is an admonition that's given as well because there, there are some nuances to the concept of stealing. There's more to it than just what normally we would think of, you know, where you go into the drugstore and steal something. Uh, there's much more to it than that, I think. So we, we want to kind of explore this. And uh, perhaps there's some corrections for some of us as well. I, I Again, I don't think, looking at my group today, I doubt that there's anybody here that runs into the drugstore and, kill, and steals a candy bar. But uh, there's more to it. Let's take a look at, at some of the uh, various categories. So the, the old notion thief has is that what's yours is mine and he intends to take it one way or the other. You know, we're living in strange times politically and we've got uh, half the country that believes in uh, the old Robin Hood mentality, taking from the rich and giving to the poor. Well, uh, certainly the Bible tells us and instructs us to give to the poor, but willingly. So it shouldn't just be taken out of somebody's uh, income and given to somebody else. That's what communism is. Or at least that's the goal of communism. It never really has uh, achieved its goal. Because once people get in power, then they uh, enrich themselves. They use the power of government to enrich themselves, all under the guise of egalitarianism. It never really happens, though. But it's a, uh, it's a false form, uh, and uh, it's thievery. And it's uh, thievery at the highest levels, for that matter. Well, again, let's let's take a little closer look here at what the Bible means when it says, thou shalt not steal. So, so we have the active uh, nature of stealing, and that's found in Leviticus chapter 6. So the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord and lie unto his neighbor in that which was delivered him to keep, or in fellowship, or in a thing taken away by violence, or hath deceived his neighbor, or have found that which was lost, and lieth concerning it, and sweareth falsely, in any of all these that a man doeth, uh, sinning against therein, then it shall be, because he hath sinned and is guilty, that he shall restore that which he took violently away, or the thing which he hath deceitfully gotten, or that which was delivered him to keep, or the lost thing which he found. You, you can see there's there's nuances now of uh, thievery. Uh, it's not just the active uh, uh, thievery that's involved. There, there are other ways of, of stealing here uh, through deceit and so on, as we see. Or all that about which he hath sworn falsely, he shall even restore it in the principle and shall add the fifth part more thereto and give it unto him to whom it appertaineth in the day of his trespass offering. So, uh, you know, what we have in a single line in the, in the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal, uh, what we have here in Leviticus is an amplification of that. 
So we're taking it now to the nth degree. So it's understood that it goes well beyond just the active uh, participation in stealing. Uh, so let's clear some of those issues up. For instance, uh, here, though the word itself is not employed, we're really talking about embezzlement, aren't we? So uh, what's embezzlement? It's it's a uh, the misuse or misappropriation of something that has been entrusted to us. Embezzlement is a violence of trust for what has been placed in a person's keeping, has been appropriated for selfish purposes. Embezzlement is frequently an offense of a bank employee or of a controller of a corporation. Of course, some people use that word uh, and they say comptroller, uh, but that's not how it's pronounced. It's controller, actually. It's a strange uh, uh, problem in the English language. At any rate, I've got two pictures here, two people that certainly illustrate what embezzlement is all about. One was Jimmy Baker, you know, with the PTL club and how he built people out of uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to enrich himself and his wife. Um, and people uh, didn't really understand what they were giving to him. And so it was by, it was pretense and in a sense embezzlement. And he was ultimately uh, imprisoned in federal prison for mail fraud because he's, he was a, taking it through the mail, basically people's offerings. He never doesn't learn his lessons, by the way. He's still on television and uh, recently even claimed to have the cure to COVID and uh, by spraying silver in your mouth or some nonsense. And um, he got in trouble again and uh, was threatened there. I don't think he went to prison or at least didn't go to prison yet again. But uh, that's what embezzlement's about. The other picture I have is uh, maybe you remember Bernie Madoff. You know, I often use the expression an aptonym. An aptonym is a uh, is someone that has a name that uh, be, kind of fits their their occupation. It's it's an unusual thing. For instance, we have we know of a dentist whose name was Doctor Payne. Uh, I don't know. I'd want to go to him, Doctor Payne. Um, so uh, that's an aptonym. And when you think of uh, Bernie Madoff, well, he made off with people's money, didn't he? He, he was. Uh, if you remember the story, this, so oh, I don't know, was it 15 years ago or so, the Bernie Madoff story? And he swindled people out of billions of dollars and he lived this luxurious lifestyle. And he had this Ponzi scheme. And, and, and we had very famous people that lost uh, millions of dollars by investing with him. And, he, and meanwhile, he was just enriching himself. And he was ultimately sentenced for 150 years in jail for, for this act. Uh, so you can speak of this as, uh, you know, it's dishonest, uh, embezzlement, uh, you're taking money under false pretense, it's, uh, he's a scam artist, whatever you want to use for expression, um, and he was ultimately sentenced for it. In the Bible you have this uh, unique illustration in the 19th chapter of uh, Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus well, we know the story, don't we? Uh, hopefully he was a wee little man, you know, we sang it in Sunday school, don't we? So Jesus uh, finds him here. He's a publican. Now these publicans, the they were officers for the Roman Empire, and they uh, their job was to collect income taxes. And uh, in a sense, they were they were viewed. In fact, the, the the name or word publican had become a derogatory name you would use it uh, as an insult you call somebody a publican and uh, that's how hated they were and they were hated for good reason the people saw uh, these uh, their own fellow people jews taking jobs from the romans and basically uh, operated as spies and they would see how much money you were making or how good your crop was or how many fish you took in the boat and uh, and then they would tax you for it, and uh, so they were they were despised people, and Zacchaeus was uh, was one of them. The other reason that they were despised is that they were permitted by Rome to take whatever amount they wanted, as long as Rome got their cut. Rome didn't care if uh, if they applied extortion and whatever other uh, uh, threatens threatenings to uh, get the money that they wanted. So Zacchaeus. Uh, we know the story, he climbs the tree, Jesus comes by and sees him there. Uh, 
and he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature, you know the story, and then Zacchaeus stood, and he's invited by Jesus, or Jesus uh, invites himself, so to speak, I'm coming to your house to eat tonight, and he runs ahead of Jesus, you know, and uh, they have this great feast, and we have the conversion of Zacchaeus occurring, and Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation. So there we have the notion of thievery. It's at a different level than we're used to. You know, you're not going in a bank with a mask and a gun and robbing the teller. Uh, you're taking it, in this case, uh, under a legal pretentious law of the Romans. Uh, he, was, he was permitted to do what he was doing, but it wasn't right. Uh, and so he took it by false accusation. I restore him fourfold. You remember that passage I showed you, the extended passage in, in Leviticus 6, where you have the, the notion of, uh, well, you had to restore. So if you were found out and, uh, and your sin found you out, then you were to uh, restore. And you had to restore, uh, in this case, fourfold. He pays him back fourfold. So it's really, uh, it's it's quite amazing that we have uh, this illustration and so Zacchaeus is saved and pays back fourfold and Jesus then rewards him and says this day salvation has come to this house for as much as he also is a son of Abraham for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost so Zacchaeus is, is, is saved of course this to the chagrin of the Pharisees and others that saw Jesus sitting with Publicans and these these sinful people that uh, used extortion and embezzlement to take money from uh, their fellow their fellows. So that was uh, a great story of God's redemptive power. So uh, well, let's go on here and we'll see other aspects. There also robbery is the act of taking what belongs to another. So we have to see that also in Leviticus six uh, to robbery. I believe is a broad definition covering several kinds of stealing. So robbery generally th uh, takes things directly, often by the use of superior force, frequently involving a weapon. Stealing suggests stealth. A pickpocket, for example, uses stealth as does a burglar. You know, today now, <laughs> you've got uh, credit cards in your pocket and they've got the chip on it, and uh, and now there are uh, there are these burglars that are actually walking uh, close to you and uh, they have uh, they have a chip reader in their hand and they kind of hold it close to your purse or your, your wallet you can't see this they might even just bump into you but they're meanwhile they're searching for your chip and then they they uh, copy your chip and then they can use your chip I mean, we're living in some strange times aren't we so uh, stealing suggests stealth a pickpocket for example uses stealth as does a burglar fraud may also be included here if so, fraud involves getting what belongs to another by deception. Here, the victim often gives what is stolen to the thief, thinking that doing so will be profitable. The only one who profits, however, is the thief. Uh, that's what some of these characters on television are doing that, uh, with their multi-million dollar, uh, lavish, opulent lifestyles, and they're taking money from widows. Uh, it's it's uh, unconscionable. Uh, but so they do it, uh, and they do it under the guise of, well, you know, you're, you'll be prosperous if you give to the uh, ministry, you know, but really they're just enriching themselves and you know, aggrandizing themselves. So beware all of this. So uh, again, the Bible warns us of such uh, manipulation. So thus John the Baptist told the tax gatherers and the soldiers of his day, and he said unto them, exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. So there are two things that Jesus, uh, or that John is bringing out at this juncture, and that, that was that uh, the publican could not take more than was lawful for him to take. So yes, he could make a living being a tax gatherer but he was not permitted to gouge people four times what they really owed. And so that's what he's setting straight here. And the other 
factor here are the uh, soldiers that were more than willing to take bribes. Uh, so, and we have it today too. It was years back, but I remember a fellow being in trouble for his third DUI, which is a mandatory uh, 90 days in jail. Well, uh, he could ill afford going to jail and uh, he would lose his job and all the rest. So he hires an attorney and the attorney pays him, I don't know what he paid, $5,000, I guess, to get him off this problem. But really, uh, there's he can't get off of it. And, uh, and I thought, uh, I happened to go with him to court. He was very concerned. And uh, here he goes to the attorney's office before he goes to the court, hands the attorney a uh, an envelope with several hundred dollars in it. And uh, the next thing I know, uh, they go to court and the arresting officer did not show up for the hearing. And when that happens, then the charge has to be thrown out. Well, I found out later that the envelope was there to pay the officer not to show up. And so all this negotiation happened in the hall. Uh, before they go before the court, the officer disappears. He's made himself a tidy sum, $400 or whatever. Uh, so you can see, uh, be content with your wages. You know, you're an officer, you made enough money and so on, but you see people are willing to be bribed and uh, injustice then occurs. Okay, another form of stealing is kidnapping. Uh, look what those evil uh, Hamas uh, terrorists have done in kidnapping people uh, and, and taking them as hostage and they'll either kill them or they'll make some kind of deal with them i mean it's deplorable what goes on uh, but uh, their their religion justifies these things and this is what uh, islam is about everything's justifiable under the laws of jihad and as long as jihad is declared against israel and against america for that matter then they can do whatever injustice uh, and they can get away with it because they're doing it for the cause of God. That's how they look at it. But kidnapping has always been deplorable. And of course, it was mentioned here in Deuteronomy. We have in the ancient Near East, kidnapping was considered a form of theft, probably because the individual would be kept as a slave rather than because he or she would be ransomed. Uh, then we have uh, what we consider passive stealing. So a man's negligence, which results in a loss to his neighbor. So Exodus 22, 1 through 15, describes several acts of negligence. You know, it's really interesting. Uh, we have people saying, well, we don't live by the Old Testament, but uh, almost all of our laws uh, are taken from Old Testament concepts. So these, these various torts and misdemeanors, as well as capital crimes, are all recorded here in the book of Exodus. Uh, and, and the idea even of compensatory uh, damages that would have to be paid, all of that is given to us in the book of Exodus and Leviticus and so on. So here it describes several acts of negligence which deprive a neighbor of his property, and, uh, which thus requires restitution. For example, if a man's pasture land has been grazed bare, and he therefore lets his animal loose so that it grazes on his neighbor's pasture, consuming it. The negligent man is guilty of passive stealing. So you can read all of this uh, if you want the details. So if a man shall cause a field or vineyard to be eaten and shall put in his beast and shall feed in another man's field at the best of his own field and at the best of his own vineyard, uh, shall make uh, restitution. So, uh, little things even and we have uh, problems perhaps you have a neighbor problems they probably had to put a fence up or something and uh these are things that could actually be taken to court at, at some cases and small claim courts so all of this is again this is in a sense a part of stealing as well it's a passive sense you didn't intend for it to happen but it happens this way here we have again a man's failure to return something lost to its owner is stealing so you know, there's a number of my books that I've been missing for about the last 30 years. So I usually put my name in the uh, in the book, but uh, sometimes people will actually bring a book back 
after five years, you know, they'll uh, kind of sheepishly bring it into my office, put it on my desk, and uh, uh, I never know who had it and how long they've had it. But uh, at any rate, this is, uh, sometimes we don't think of it that way. People uh, take books from the library and they forget to bring it back. And that, uh, it's a form of stealing. So if a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord have found that which was lost and lieth concerning it and sweareth falsely, the old adage, finders, keepers, losers, weepers, is shown to be an excuse for theft. To find what belongs to another and not to return it is to steal it by one's negligence or refusal to return it. Clear instructions regarding the returning of lost items is also given in the book of Deuteronomy. So, see, God, it covers almost, if you think about it, all these uh, modern distresses that we have today were actually dealt with in ancient times. And there's the passage there. Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or his sheep go astray and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt in any case bring them again unto thy brother. And if thy brother be not nigh unto thee, or if thou know him not, then thou shalt bring it unto thine own house, and it shall be with thee until thy brother seek after it. I think, you know, probably all of us here at one time or another have uh, maybe looked in our uh, envelope after we went to the bank, you know, and found out that they gave us $50 more than they should. And you might say, well, that's their problem, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to gain from this. Or if somebody forgot to charge you for an item, uh, this happens quite often. Uh, you know, they forget to check something out. So um, eh, we have an obligation to be honest about these things. When we were buying our church building years back, is very interesting stories here, but uh, uh, we uh, actually have the bank, we had put money into the bank to purchase the property, and uh, the bank gave us too much money in interest to the tune of like $30,000. And uh, well, we didn't, uh, at that particular time, didn't realize it. And uh, so we went ahead and purchased the building and then realized later that no, we had, the, there was a mistake here that was made. And the bank, I guess, called us at some point and said, it was a terrible mistake that had been made. And uh, so we paid it all back to them. Um, uh, well, we, that's the obligation. You could have argued, well, there's nothing they can do about it. You know, that was their mistake. And they, you know, but uh, we have to do the right thing. Uh, elsewise, that's considered stealing, as you can see here from this. Failure to give what belongs to another is stealing. So, uh, so we have all these various uh, categories of theft. Uh, you know, I want to uh, probably add another one that people don't usually think about too often, but it's gambling. Gambling is a form of stealing uh, from somebody else. I'd learned my lesson early on. I, I, I've never had any temptation to gamble. It, to me, I, I can't think of anything more foolish than as far as throwing your money away. I tell gamblers that have this addiction that, you know, the house never loses, and that's true. But I had learned my lesson very early on when I, uh, in grade school, and I had a Duke Snyder card, you know, which was my favorite baseball player. And uh, uh, you had to flip for uh, Duke Snyder. So um, this fella had a Duke Snyder card, and I think, I don't know what I had, Willie Mays or something like that. And, uh, and in those days, you would flip. If you flip the card, then you would uh, lose it or you'd gain it. One of the two depends on was heads or tails. So if you flip the baseball card and land it up, it was yours then. Uh, and you could take it from the guy, you know. So that uh, we flipped the cards and so on, and I lost the bet. And Snyder, as a result, lost Willie Mays along with it. So um, uh, you, learn, you learn your lessons, hopefully, about gambling. It's a sin. And uh, though it's not, uh, I, I don't think it's uh, expressly told to us in the Bible, but we have principles that we can go by that I think pretty clearly denounce the concept. It's a form of, of stealing. And Isaiah it says, but uh, ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop and that furnished the drink offering unto that number. 
it's a curious uh, passage, and uh, I, I think we can uh, we can expatiate on this a bit if you find it interesting. Although I, you know, I don't I don't know that I have any gamblers here, but uh, it's becoming prevalent with people with the lottery now, with so many people gambling on sports. Uh, they make it so easy. It's online gambling that's happening now. We have casinos. Uh, Governor Rendell said if we build a casino down on the north side that we'll not be paying, won't have to pay any more property taxes. I mean, this is with politicians, what liars. And uh, I'm still paying property tax. But they, uh, they get a lot of revenue from this. Well, again, it's a form of uh, stealing. So, um, Therefore, will I number you uh, to the sword, and you shall bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, you did not answer. When I spake, you did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servant shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. Behold, my servant shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servant shall rejoice, but ye shall be ashamed. Behold, my servant shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart, and shall a howl for vexation of spirit. Now let's try to explain the context here. Um, and it's a bit confusing maybe, but uh, let's see if we can just ferret this thing, thing out. So, uh, but ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop. Now, I have that underlined in, here in green so that uh, this is where we have to go back perhaps to the original language and see what uh, the context is about. It's kind of a confusing context. And that furnished the drink offering unto that number. So we have these two, and we want to go back to the original language, and that troop is Gad, you know. So we, we learned this with the 12 sons of Israel. So Gad was the name of the, of the pan-Semitic god of fortune, usually depicted as a male, but sometimes as a female. So uh, the table uh, for Gad uh, spoke of the god of, of fortune, of good luck, in other words. That's what gambling's all about. And gamblers are very superstitious people, and they, you know, they, they wear amulets. They, uh, they have to wear a certain shirt when they go to the uh, poker table and all the rest. You know, they're very superstitious. Baseball players, very superstitious. Uh, if they have a hitting streak going on, uh, they have to wear the same socks. Uh, and, and it's all uh, it's foolishness, of course, but nonetheless, they believe there's a power in good luck and uh, they don't want to tempt the fates, that sort of thing. Uh, well, it's paganism in, in a sense and the, and the table for the god of fortune. So that's really how this reads in its literal sense. They prepare a table for the god of fortune. Now we have uh, gambling tables of all sorts down in a casino. I've never been in one, but I've seen pictures of a casino. So we know what they're about. Uh, and uh, I I'm wondering now, is this what Isaiah is speaking about? Uh, was it a form of paganism? And, uh, and I think that it's not too far a stretch here. And they furnish a drink offering unto that number. Now we have Manat, a Syrian deity. Uh, remember Mena, Mena, Tekel, Hershon, which was the words that uh, the handwriting on the wall that came down during Belshazzar's uh, orgiastic uh, feast. So Manat, a Syrian deity. But she was the goddess of bad fortune. So you know you had the yin and the yang here. You had the good fortune and the bad fortune. Good luck and bad luck is what this is about. And it seems to, uh, to me that Isaiah here now is excoriating his people that were involved in these tables and involved in making drink offerings to the goddess of bad fortune so as to placate uh, bad luck and to keep bad luck away from you. You know, um, well, my Italian grandmother used to have garlic uh, that you would tie around the front of the door. Good luck would keep the bad luck away from us uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, and so, uh, these superstitions that people have, you know, they, the black cat is bad luck. You don't walk under a ladder. and uh, All of these were pagan concepts. So I think that Isaiah here is, is at least pointing to it. If, not, 
if not directly to gambling, certainly to these false gods. Um, so sometimes it pays for us to actually go back and look at the etymology of the various words. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the translation because that's what Gad means. It means that troop, and that's certainly what uh, that number, Manat, means. But uh, when you look at the etymology, where did the words come from and what were they meant to be originally, then you begin to uh, see maybe a deeper uh, meaning, deeper concept to it. All right, so again, the god of fortune, the god of destiny, bad fortune. So, uh, so I believe that uh, gambling, a form of stealing, it's, a, it's certainly a form of fatalism, the belief of good luck and bad luck. Christians don't have to live by good luck and bad luck. But today we have get-rich-quick schemes, and they're always a hoax. Uh, they bring poverty, not wealth. I uh, used to have a fellow, and he would call me quite frequently and say, oh, he said, uh, I'm going to be rich. And I, uh, I knew uh, what was, he'd get these uh, things in the mail, that you had just won a million dollars. And it was the Clearinghouse Publishing Company. And I would tell him, now, did you read the fine print? You, I said, you're going to have to buy magazines. Well, yes, he said. I, you know, I, he understood that. But it said here that he won a million. I said, well, you, you don't win it. You're, you're entered in to win it. That's all. And the chances of you winning are one in a hundred million. So, but they don't, they don't give you that information unless it's in very small print. But I think the whole concept uh, that my, my problems are going to be over. My trouble is going to be ended. All it takes is, you know, one investment. And so I can take uh, and go down, stand in the lottery line with my $1 bill in my hand, and they could change my entire destiny. And uh, the Bible decries the notion of getting rich quick. It's a dangerous prospect. Well, I have a sermon on, uh, on lottery losers, I call it. And, uh, of course, there's a book about this, about the people that have put uh, money into the lottery and they, uh, they won the big one. But within five years or ten years, uh, they, we find out they have no money left. They're living in some cabin somewhere in the woods and they've lost all their friends and they've divorced their uh, husband or their wife and so on. And uh, they're not the happier for it, that's for sure. He that hastens to be rich hath an evil eye and considers not that poverty shall come upon him. So uh, God warns about this notion. Uh, the divinely established means of getting ahead is by work. And you'll see this repeatedly in the scripture. Uh, so it's not by gambling, it'll be by hard labor, hard work. Um, and of course, the sin of greed, which is really the motivation in gambling, greed, covetousness. It motivates individuals to gamble. And that motivation, greed, is a sin. And there's a number of verses we could cite on this. The, probably the most famous is 1 Timothy 6, uh, where it speaks about uh, covetousness and, uh, and the evil. You know, we often use the wrong expression there that the love of money is evil, but the love, the love of money is, is the root of all evil, which some coveted after so there's covetousness and uh, and the hope of gaining and uh, it's a dangerous proposition certainly gambling indicates a lack of trust in God's ability to provide and uh, how many scriptures tell us of God's abundant supply for the believer super abundant for that matter uh, meeting all of our needs according to his riches and glory and gambling and the true riches are spiritual and eternal. So our riches we see in Philippians and of course the book of Ephesians repeats the concept of rich, uh, the richness of God's mercy. So we find over and over again that these are things uh, that are quite spiritual and our, our great rewards are waiting in the world to come. And we should look to God as our source of supply uh, Philippians 4.19, a very famous verse there, God supplying all of our needs according to his riches and glory. And uh, gambling expressly denies God's sovereignty and care. Uh, so the only place really in the scripture outside of what I just showed you in Isaiah 
might be, uh, as we well know, at the cross where they gambled over the cloak of Jesus. Uh, so it's seen in a very negative light right there as well. So that's just uh, a, a little rehearsal on the sin of gambling. Maybe it, it's helpful, maybe not. Maybe you know somebody that has this addiction and, uh, and they might be looking for an answer. Hopefully you have it now. So, uh, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. So we've got uh, labor, uh, extol. Bible telling us that this is good for us. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Uh, so from the beginning of the uh, of the sin of Adam. Labor was instituted by God. Uh, six days shalt thou labor. He says to Adam that it'll be by the sweat of your brow. Uh, you'll have to toil. Uh, now this, of course, is, uh, you could say that it's retributive, but really it's, it's, it's designed here for God, for man's good. Um, there is an old adage, it's not biblical, but it's certainly wise, and, and that is that the idle mind is the devil's play yard. So it's important for people to be active. It's important for people to work. And so uh, it's, it's installed here as a safeguard against sin. Uh, so let us labor, uh, we we'll find here, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good in Ephesians. And in Second Thessalonians, neither did we, uh, we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travailed night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. So uh, laboring is a good thing. You know, uh, we have now, since the beginning of our church ministry 50 years ago, we've always uh, done everything ourselves. Uh, we hardly ever pay anybody to do anything. Uh, well, we never had a whole lot of money to, anyway, but by the same token, it has been a good practice uh, for people to work and to do that, which is God's work, is a great honor as far as I'm concerned, of course, then to help others. Uh, you know, that middle picture, I remember uh, we had a, we had uh, two people in the church and they were uh, an older couple and they were retired and they had worked all their lives. Both of them were steel workers, the husband and the wife. They worked on the U.S. Steel Building downtown. But now they were uh, infirmed, and they were having a very difficult time. The wife had stroked and couldn't get out of her house uh, to get to the doctors because uh, they had numerous steps, 20-some steps to get up and down, and she couldn't get out from the front door. And the back door, he uh, he would take her up through the backyard and up a hill, up about uh, 40 feet up a hill, in a kind of stiff incline, and would wheel her up. And here he was infirmed himself. And I uh, saw the situation and said, you know, we want to help and see what we can do to help you here. And um, So we dug out a driveway and we poured about uh, 20 yards of cement, which is a lot of cement, and finished it and gave them a, a driveway all the way up to the back uh, entry where he could pull his car and get her in and out uh, to her appointments. So we learned the lesson and have learned now all these many years to, uh, to work and to work hard. And it is a good thing. And, and it's something, of course, that God admonishes us to maintain now all of us are getting much older and it's getting a lot more difficult for us to do it but um, hoping that the next generation that's coming up will learn lessons from us about the importance that uh, industry is for even when we were with you this commanded you that if and he would not work neither should he eat for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly walking not at all but are busy bodies now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. So, so important for us to labor 
that we might give to those what you're in need. And that's what the, the scripture goes on to tell us here. As uh, we labor, certainly, but we labor also so that we might have access and be able to take what access we have and to help people that are in true need. Well, of course, I think all of us know that there's two kinds of people in the world. There's, there's givers and there's takers. So Acts tells us, I've showed you all things now that so laboring, you ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now I find that really fascinating, Acts chapter 20, and the Apostle Paul's giving final instructions to the church at Ephesus. And how interesting it is here that he, he cites something that Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And as you can look uh, through the Gospels and uh, you'll not find Jesus ever saying that one time. So what did Paul have in mind here? And uh, what does he mean that the Lord said this and the Lord Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive? Well, of course, uh, John even tells us in the gospel that there are many things that Jesus did and said that aren't contained in the gospels. So this might be just an oral tradition, but certainly the life of Jesus, the whole life of Jesus illustrates this. Jesus was not a taker. He came to give and to give his life as a, an ultimate sacrifice for the sins of people. So uh, what a difference. Uh, and the ways of Jesus are so much different than the ways of man. You know, man is all about uh, self and aggrandizing, making for ourselves. And, uh, the Bible really teaches us a better way and to give. And that's what the word charity is about. The word agape in the original language is self-sacrificing. In Matthew 25, Jesus said, uh, I was in hunger and you gave me meat. Remember, they, they asked him, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we? He said, I was hungry, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, well, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and, and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. So, um, and uh, so he admonishes us to do this and to live this way as believers and to not talk about love, but to live it and to put ourselves in the situation where it costs us something uh, and to do for others. Christ is the ultimate example and, and the consummate uh, uh, giver. Let us be as the Lord. So uh, let him labor, he says, working with his hands, that thing which is good that we may be able to give. In Luke 21, we have the illustration of the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. He saw a poor widow casting into the two mites. But he said of a truth, I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast into their offerings of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. So the Bible teaches uh, what we call altruism. And so it's in direct contrast with the spirit of our age, egotism, people living for themselves. Uh, the younger of them said to his father, give me, give me, you know, this is what they say, give me the portion of goods that follows to me. And he, he divided unto him his living. Egotism says, I want and I deserve and you ought to do this for me. Altruism is just the opposite of this. So the widow shows by her, her altruism that she gives all that she has. Uh, so very important for us to learn these lessons what true charity is. You know, it's interesting when you see uh, this little chart for the poor are the most charitable people. Uh, it's so true. You know, they uh, every year, year or so, they, uh, they take a tally of what the politicians give, uh, <laughs> you know, 1% of their income. <laughs> They're multimillionaires, but this is you know, the more people have, the more they hold on to what they have. And just uh, completely opposite to what the Bible teaches. Give, he says, it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give unto your bosom. 
for with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. Uh, there's the story of the man that came into the church and stood up to give testimony one day. And he said, you know, 10 years ago, I came into this church and all I had was a $5 bill. That was all I had left. I, I was totally broke. He said, and when the offering plate came around, I decided like the widow to put in all that I had. And I put my $5 bill in that offering plate. It says, now 10 years later, I have so prospered, I own several businesses. I have millions of dollars in my bank account and God has really rewarded me. And uh, a little old lady sitting by him stood up and said, I dare you to do it again. So of course, you know, when you have everything, it's a little harder to give it all, isn't it? But when you have nothing, in a sense. So, well, let us learn the lesson from all of this. Now, there's more to say here in Ephesians 4, and we're, we're going to get to this next week, but we've come to the end of our lesson. So, Lord, uh, what we have before us in Ephesians 4, and for that matter, the fifth chapter, is one of those unique places in the Bible, very instructional, hortatory, uh, and it's for believers to learn the lesson of what true biblical Christianity is. So hopefully, Lord, we've gotten some insights and uh, we take these very practical lessons, Lord, and we want to live them. Uh, so I pray, Lord, we'll not be just hearers, but now doers of that which we've heard this morning. Bring a blessing to us, Lord. We thank you for giving us the greatest gift of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a gift, Lord, that uh, in particular during this time of the year, we would think people would be far more interested in. And I pray, Lord, that that would be the case, that we would see people brought to the light during the next few weeks, that people's hearts will open to the truth of the gospel and uh, not make just some superficial uh, move towards God, but a life-changing move. We pray, Father, for uh, each of us to be a witness to the best of our ability during these dark days that we live in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.